we do know is a lot of the traditional things you feel that we have been taught about marketing, about purchase intent, uh, the power of some of these models, is utter hogwash and does not reflect in any way how people really make decisions in life. And we need to, if we're going to help them make better decisions, we need to understand how they're really making the decisions now. And I think there's a lot of government time and money spended trying to persuade, spent trying to persuade us to do things in a rational, considered, thoughtful manner. And the reality is they'd be much better off sometimes trying to make us, help us make the right choices, whether that's saving for our pensions, whether that's you know, investing for the future, whatever those choices are, than they are trying to have really rational, considered, thoughtful debates. Um, and we want to encourage everyone we work with to try experimenting because I suspect even in your own business there are plenty of yellow lines around that parking machine uh, that you could find and be a hero for discovering um, that you're never going to find if what you do is really traditional asking people what they want and what they're going to do. Yeah? You have to get better at observing and better at obliquely understanding their behavior um, because, trust me, we're all really, really good at lying about what we really do. Yeah? Uh, and then the other bit is, just trying to put this in context, we actually aren't intelligent. We don't do that stuff that we think we do, that we say we do. And if you ever want the example, I once spoke at a conference of 6,000 accountants, okay? And I was on to talk to them about brand valuation and branding. And I'm in this conference, and I asked the 6,000 accountants three questions. Okay. The first question I ask them is, how many of them know how to do investment appraisal? Okay. 6,000 accountants stick their hand in the air. It doesn't matter if it's discounted cash flow, net present value, any of the exciting kind of models. They all know how to do investment appraisal. It's their stock in trade. The second thing I ask them is, how many of them own a car? And again, 6,000 accountants, these are prosperous people, 6,000 of the wealthiest accountants in the world, they all stick their hand in the air. And then I ask them, how many of them? did a pence per mile running cost analysis of their car before they bought it, okay? And six of the saddest people you've ever seen <laughs> sat in the front row where they'd probably been since high school, um, admitted that they'd done investment appraisal. The rest of them did what we do, yeah? And they wandered into the car showroom and they said, I want that one, and I'd like it in red, yeah? <laughs> Um, and that is the harsh reality of what we're dealing with. It actually doesn't matter whether you've bought a $500, you know, beaten up car off a car lot or a, you know, $50,000 car. It doesn't really matter which. You're not doing the maths, yeah? You're just making the choices, yeah? And those choices really matter, okay? Um, and then the last bit really is the theory. I just want to give you one theory because I think this is much underused in, in marketing. The theory of relative deprivation. Okay, if you want to make it sound intellectual. Uh, and the reason why this theory is relevant is that if my house burns down uh, in a fire, I feel that somehow it's been terrible. But if my entire you know, uh, village or something is destroyed, uh, then I feel I'm lucky to be alive. Okay? And the reality is people understand relative deprivation in lots and lots of situations. And in marketing, we see it before us all the time. I'll give you another quick example. So you go to an airline. I flew on a plane today. Uh, if you're you know, in front of that little curtain that they have between economy and business class, yeah? um, why does the curtain exist? The curtain exists to stop rioting. Yeah? You don't want to be confronted with the other person having the posh dinner and the champagne literally three feet from where you're sitting. The purpose of the curtain is so you're not confronted with that. And yet, we're capable of being staggeringly altruistic and friendly in lots of situations. So the weird one I also saw was a Sainsbury's trying to do this in supermarkets. They had a fantastic one in supermarkets, where if you are in charge of a family, you're a very big customer of supermarkets. Yeah? Um, and apologies may always be slightly different, different shopping habits in different countries. But in the UK, that could mean you're spending as much as three or four thousand pounds a year on food for your family in the supermarket and nappies and all of those other things that you end up buying. Um, and therefore, you're a really big customer. So what they wanted to do was use their loyalty program to have special treatment for the good customers and you know, ordinary treatment for the ordinary customers. Um, and they tried to introduce this, and there was very nearly a riot. Okay? Uh, and they thought, oh, this must be wrong. And they tried again, and there was nearly another riot. 
Uh, and by now, the police were weary about, you know, showing up at Sainsbury's stores to hold people back who were otherwise going to fight with other people. And the weird thing with that they realized, which they've institutionalized for years in UK supermarkets, is the altruistic bit of letting someone else who is buying less things than you in front of you, totally fine. Five items or less. I think one of the supermarkets has gone 20% better than everyone else, and they're now six items or less, because, of course, that extra six item was always the vital one that caused the, the riot. The idea that you would let someone else in in front of you, totally fine, but the idea that they could treat someone who spent more than you differently to you in an egalitarian environment like a supermarket, that's pretty annoying. You know, people are kind of fronting up to one another. There's going to be a scrap. Um, and that's the reality of what we're trying to kind of deal with. You've got to understand the inequalities sometimes if we're going to solve them. Yeah. So I think there is old school brand building and there is 21st century brand building driven by the behavioral sciences. And they are different. And you need to do things differently if you want to get those advantages, if you want to get the benefits of what you've been learning all along. And I think the behavioral sciences simply confirms some of the heuristics and rules you've always known about other people, but where your, I don't know, finance team or your, you know, very rational market research team sometimes we're trying to persuade you that, oh no, we've got to understand this from a rational basis, we've got to really, you know, under, and that's not how people are making the decisions and the choices.